Well, brethren, good morning and uh, also a very happy Christmas to you all at this time of year. And uh, please, would you turn with me to Daniel chapter 7 and the second half of this chapter tonight. And before we do so, shall we just pray? Lord, we do thank you for all that you have given to us. Thank you that we acknowledge that we continue to this day that our life and health and our being comes from the living God. And we thank you for it and we thank you that the things that have proceeded from your mouth are to be more desired than silver or gold. And we thank you, therefore, that this morning or this evening, when any are listening to this, that we're able to sit at the feet of Christ tonight. And we pray that you would indeed by our shepherds and you would speak to us this evening and grant us understanding, light and truth in your word this night. Amen. So I'll be reading the second half of Daniel in chapter 7 and from verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me, and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured broken pieces and swamped and sorry, and stamped the residue with his feet and of the ten horns that were in his head and of the other which came up and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows I beheld. And the same horn which, uh, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Then he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand, until a time and times and the dividing of time. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my cottage, cogitations much troubled me and my countenance changed to me but I kept the matter in my heart. Well some might wonder why it is that uh, on Christmas Eve at a time where we come to celebrate the birth of Christ that uh, I should continue on preaching through the book of Daniel in chapter 7 and one that speaks about the Antichrist and uh, and the many Antichrists that there have been already through time and you might wonder, well, why why persist with this at a time of Christmas? And uh, well, I obviously saw God about whether to continue this series now. And uh, I very much thought it was uh, thrilling to look at these things. Uh, and also because they do speak of Christ. As I said last week, there are many who look at eschatology, the study of end time things, the study of things before Christ's return. And we as Christians, with good intention, can end up with slightly the wrong focus, can't we, of curiosity of what will be the sequence of things. When is Christ coming back? And take our eyes from the fact that the truth that we should be rejoicing in is the coming of Christ. And these truths that we're looking at this evening are the immediate events, the order of the kingdoms of this world, the precede the coming of Christ. This, These chapters are talking about the 
first coming of Christ and then of his glorious second coming. And, and doesn't that thrill our hearts? On the other hand, I think we can sometimes be grieved by the way that Christ is represented. That is, in the world and at Christmas time, there can be a tendency to think of Christ in this beautiful nativity scene where his mother and father have stood around a, a cradle, a manger, normally used for feeding animals where the baby Christ was laid. And there's a focus on the baby Christ. Well, the Bible has no such emphasis in it, does it? It speaks about him becoming fully man, but being fully God to bear our sins upon the cross. But the, then it talks of his glorious coming, the fulfillment of all things, when Christ will finally be glorified. And this chapter speaks, uh, oozes truth and excitement as we look at the glorious coming of the King of Kings and of the Lord of Lords, the one whom we love, whom one day our eyes will see. And I suppose when we hear of one whom we love spoken of ill in an ill manner or even not maybe deliberately, but little. So it, there's something that stirs inside us to think, but I know them and they, they are not like that. And it's the same, isn't it? As we see some narratives concerning Christmas, that it, it undermines who Christ is. Now, don't get me wrong. The angels worshipped and rejoiced at the coming of Christ and, and that all the prophets and servants of God were waiting for that day when Christ would be manifested in the flesh. And he came, didn't he, to save all of mankind. But he is also coming to be king. And that's what I would like to speak about tonight. Not about the revealing of the Antichrist that this chapter does speak about, but, but of the coming of the king. And that's what I'd like to call the talk this evening, when Christ will be glorified. And I could end there, isn't it? And we could end by saying, Amen. Yea, and amen. But thank God that he has given us these truths, which we are to look at together tonight. Now, I remembered last week that I touched on the this uh, dream that Daniel had been given. If you remember in Daniel's chapter one through six, he interprets various dreams and images and revelations that others are given. But in this instance, in chapter seven, we find that Daniel had his dream of the four beasts. And it, if you remember, I said how much it troubled Daniel by what was going on. But one thing in particular troubled him, which is the beginning of the, our reading tonight in verse 15, that he had seen all of these great beasts, which are four kings. Uh, but in verse 19 of the four, the fourth is one particularly that catches his godly mind. And as we know, Daniel was a godly man whom the spirit of Christ was witnessing and using to speak. And, and the spirit has given us further insight into this fourth piece, further things that we should draw our attention to, which are written for the church, not only for the Jewish people, but for the church of God in all times. And, and now the people of God in Christ that these truths are written for. He says in verse 19, then would I know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron and his nails of brass, which devoured, broken pieces and stamped the residue with his feet and of the ten horns that were in his head and the other which came up and before whom there fell even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And it's this fourth beast, and then this little horn that's described. He, if, as we read there, this fourth beast isn't like, can't be described in the same manner as the others were, where the first was, if you remember, like a lion, and the second like a bear, and the third like a leopard. This fourth is different. It's not something that he can simply say it is like this. And the beasts show that they're from the earth. They are not of gods, but it describes their character. And, and we've covered, I covered last week, and I think the scriptures are plain about what the first three beasts are. But this fourth one particularly caught Daniel's zeal and his spirit to know what it actually is and what it means. Now, I don't want to be, uh, that is to 
be exhaustive tonight, uh, and I'm not uh, trying here to um, speak uh, fully and expound the scriptures like in a in a Bible study, but to be practical, make application. So forgive me, there will be gaps in the things that I say tonight, and I trust that you might be able to study these and search the scripture and uh, combine uh, search and compare scripture to scripture. But we see three characteristics of this fourth beast. See, in verse 23, uh, he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms. Now, we've seen how great the Babylonian kingdom was and the Greek kingdom, the Medo-Persian kingdom. They were great kingdoms. But this one shall be different to all of the others before. And it will devour the whole earth. That's why its teeth are described as being like of lions. It, it, its boundary won't be limited by a certain region where it will exert power, but it will cover the whole earth. It was once said of the British Empire that the sun never goes down on it. And there's something proud, wasn't there, in that statement. And we can certainly say today that the sun goes down on it. But even at these great empires, there were great limits to their power. We see in our nation how the Roman Empire built Hadrian's Wall. And why was that? It was simply that they couldn't subdue the northern uh, people in Britain, but they built a wall to contain it and, and, as it were, just to seal it off because they couldn't fight against it. But this kingdom will be different. It will devour the whole earth. That's it, its first characteristic. Then it will, in verse 25, it will do something very extraordinary. It will speak great words against the Most High. It will be intrinsically blasphemous in that which it does. And thirdly, in verse 25, shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Uh, as with all these devilish kingdoms, there's a sense of seeking glory for themselves, but, but because of the uh, and to rage against heaven, and consequently to rage also against the people of God. And if I might make one aside, it is worth remembering that, isn't it? That uh, very often, because we love the Lord Jesus Christ and wish to serve us, there's something in the fallen nature of man, which is enmity with God, and therefore is enmity by nature with the people of God. Now, we should never give legitimate account for people to speak ill of us. We should be blameless in our work. In our lifestyle, there should be no legitimate reason for them to be opposed to us. But very often, there is a, a, a natural and instinctive antagonism, 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 forgive me, against the people of God, which reflects the spirit of this world. And this is something of the character of this fourth beast. And, and if you allow me, oh, it's very grateful that my daily readings coincidentally took me to Revelation 13. Uh, the, just yesterday morning. And you see exactly the same description of this beast. Uh, it says in Revelation 13, there's no need to go there, but it, it was given a great mouth. That is a mouth to speak blasphemy against God. It was given power, it says in verse five, to continue 42 months. And, and that is so interesting when you look at this. Uh, and isn't it interesting? Because if you Look down at Daniel chapter 17 and verse 25. It says not 42 months, but a time and times and the dividing of time. Now, there are many. And I think if you use Revelation 13 to interpret this 42 months, now what can time and times and, and half a time mean? Well, there are generally it's generally agreed that the time refers to one year. Times referred to two years and the dividing of time to be half a year. In other words, if you add those up, a time one plus two plus a half, three and a half years, which broadly speaking is exactly the same as 42 months, the same beast. Thank God he's shown us that the beast of Revelation 13 is the same that there is here in Daniel chapter 17. And, and the last parallel which supports Daniel 7, we find in Revelation 13 in verse 7, there is given unto him to make war with the saints. See, this diverse and great beast 
was not satisfied simply to gain great, uh, will not be simply satisfied to gain dominion over the whole earth, but will also oppose itself against God and will speak blasphemy against him. And he will also, therefore, seek to make war with the saints, with uh, now, we might say, mightn't we, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, whom the, the Bible addresses as the saints, doesn't it? Those who have been sanctified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will seek to make war with them. These people who will not worship when the music plays, and worship a false god, who will not cease from thanking and worshipping God and following him and his word. These people who are a problem, whom he intrinsically hates, he will seek to make war with them. And this might therefore seem to be a very negative message to bring on Christmas Eve, but it is, on the other hand, a very necessary one. We might just draw out a few things to comment on this point here. Well, first of all, we find that it, this power is given to the beast for a specific amount of time. Just as in, uh, and it's no different to the kingdoms which preceded him, the Babylonian, the Medo-Persian and the Greek Empire, the times and places of those kingdoms were, were, were determined by none other than the King of Heaven. In fact, when Daniel speaks on behalf of God to Nebuchadnezzar, he says, O thou King, the Most High God gave, sorry, when he speaks to Belshazzar, forgive me, he says, O thou King, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom. And this is exactly the, the language that is given in the book of Revelation. He, he says of this beast three times just that phrase. He says in verse five, there was given unto him a mouth. And it says, and was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And then in verse seven, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints. That is that he could have no power but of God, that his times, the bounds of his, of his power have been given by the most high God. And though he might exalt himself to the height of heaven, he could have no power, but God had permitted it. Now you might say, well, does God cause evil therefore? Is it, has it come from him? And I thought a useful illustration would be this, when Job speaks of our great God, he, he says in chapter 38 and verse 11 that who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb or shut up the sea with doors when it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb. Sorry. And verse 10 and break and break up for it my decree place and set bars and doors and said, hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. And God is saying in Job. Who is like unto me that has said to the oceans, to all the seas, hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. And that's, I think, rather a, a, a nice analogy to what God has said uh, will come with the Antichrist, that hitherto may you act, you may blaspheme, you may make war with my people, but your time is limited to three and a half years. That, that is all. You may do no more than that which I have permitted, and it has not been of your own imagination and creation, but rather it has been given, permitted of God, that he might be able to do this. Even though all nations will worship him, it is for a time and times and the dividing of time, the times that God has appointed, not of his own fruition or will, but he will be suddenly destroyed. And the second thing that is so astonishing is that it, it's not enough simply for all nations to serve him. Do you see what it says that it, he will speak very great things in verse 20 of Daniel chapter 7, whose look was more stout than the fellows. You see, it was not enough that he should devour the whole earth, but also 
He wishes to be worshipped as God. And that's a very important distinction to realize that it's not only that he wants to be conquered, but he also has a, a devilish desire to be worshipped also. That's when Revelation 13, you find that there's an image of the beast set up and the, there's power that it might speak great words and that everyone might worship him. It says in verse 8 of Revelation 13, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life from the foundation of the world. That's Revelation 13 and verse 8. See, he doesn't only seek this beast to be uh, to be king, but also to be worshipped. And that may sound like a very obvious thing to say, but it, it's very obvious, isn't it? You know, when he tempted Christ, what was it that he, he sought? Uh, in one instance, it was that Christ would bow down and worship him. And this has always been the desire of the enemy, that he might be in the place of God. The, the abomination of desolation is why, you know, the, the one who commits the ultimate blasphemy will seek that all nations should worship him. And it's very interesting when you look through history, how these various characters have emerged. And next week, Lord willing, in Daniel chapter eight, we'll see something of this man, uh, and Anti Antiochus Epiphanes, who was one of the four ends of the Greek empire, who set himself up as God. And he called himself Epiphanes, which is God manifested. And he had such a spirit of Antichrist. He was just around 175 years before Christ. But, you know, it's well reported in history books. You can read the Encyclopedia Britannica and find out what he did. But he set up in the temple in Jerusalem an image of the Roman false god Zeus. He also set up an image of himself in the temple. He forbade any of the normal temple activities to be conducted, but ordered that everyone was to worship only at the temple of Zeus and at his own. You, you see what I mean? There was a, a zeal not only to defeat the Jewish people, but also that he might be worshipped. This is really what the spirit of this world is about. And, and how contrary to God it is. Isn't that any wonder that the Lord says that all that is in the world, the lust of life, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes is not of the Father, but is of the world. And because it, it, it is the way which the devil will seek to be worshipped. And we must stand firm in the faith, mustn't we? And know that it is only Christ who is to be worshipped. But one last thing, because I talked about the coming of the king. And what's the last thing that is unique uh, about this fourth king? Well, it is because this is the king who will be in place when Christ returns in his glory. It says in verse 26, but the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions shall serve and obey him. Just as it says in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 8, the Lord shall consume him with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. You see, though there is this time of trial, where, when the Antichrist will be revealed and will make war with the saints and will blaspheme and fill the earth with worship of himself and deny Christ, the Lord himself will descend from heaven. It's interesting, the contrast, and thank God for someone else making this point. The beasts arise out of the earth. Christ descends from his heavenly throne. And just the brightness of his coming will destroy him and consume him the Antichrist. He doesn't even need to lift a hand, to say a word. Purely the brightness of Christ's glory will consume him. And brethren, as we, as we walk our pilgrim path through this life, isn't that the case that everything the world has to offer that can appear to allure and be so great, 
compared to Christ and his glory, are, are is nothing, are they? They are nothing compared to the glory which Christ has. And not only that which Christ has, and he is king and, and king of kings and lord of lords, and he will, he will bring his kingdom in. It's not that we will produce his kingdom and then Christ will return. He will do it by the spirit and the brightness of his hand. But astonishing, we not only look for the revealing of the king, the coming of the kingdom, but he also look at these astonishing truths in verse 27, because you might read it and think it says something that it doesn't say. But it says the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to. What's it going to say now? Christ, the father, no, to the people of the saints of the most high. It, it almost takes you back, doesn't it? You read it and think, well, there's no way that Christ would share something of his kingdom with us. But he has, he makes us kings and priests unto God. And despite us having to go through this, this time of the Antichrist, what he says is that those who endure to the end, he will give his kingdom also to and we will reign with Christ. Now, forgive me, I don't have time to deal with the various di differing views over some of these matters. And for those who are pre-tribulation believers or post or a-tribulation believers, I don't mean to step on your toes tonight. And there are some who would view that, well, we won't, we'll be raptured before the revealing of the Antichrist. But I, I must say in this passage here, which I'm, I'm expounding tonight, uh, there isn't that teaching here now. There is a description of the coming of the Antichrist, how we'll make war with the people of God, and then the coming of Christ. But we have that hope, don't we? Not in this world, not of dominion and ruling in this world, but at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will consume with the brightness of his coming, that dramatic and sudden appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ when the end shall come. But for now, there is a need, isn't there, to endure. And if I might finish with just a few very, very brief statements. And isn't that, what's, what, what can we say to these things? Well, first of all, isn't it that he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved, as Matthew 24 and verse 13 says. In other words, there is a need, isn't there, for endurance for us to bear the conflict, to bear oppression that there might be from the world, to resist the flesh, the world and the sin, the things that allure, that seek to wear us down, that seek to take us away from Christ and from patient waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ. What Christ says to us tonight is it is but for a season, the seasons determined of God's hand. And please, brethren, may we endure, not lose faith, lose strength, but endure unto the end because the end is glorious when Christ will be revealed and let us be found in him on that day. Second is, we might wonder, why does the book of Daniel not end here in chapter eight? You see, it comes to the end and, and we have then Christ's return, hallelujah, and his coming. We might think, well, why doesn't the book of Daniel end at chapter seven? Because it would seem that it is complete, but thank God for his tender mercy, his tenderness his gentleness with us, because we find that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Not that we might be half prepared, but as the book of Timothy says, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And the next few chapters in Daniel 8 go on, having revealed us some of these mysteries. We now, in the subsequent chapters, delve further into them. We have practical application that we might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, and nothing like the word of God can do us like this. And may I just remind us of one thing, that which our enemy, the devil, that subtle and wise and powerful one whom we must not speak ill or inadvertently, unwisely, but he seeks to be worshipped, doesn't he? But must not we not respond in the same manner that Christ did in his bodily temptations? It is written, thou shalt worship 
the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. That truth will stand forever true. Who is the most high? Despite everything that might transpire in this world, everything that might come about, it is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, the God, uh, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit, who are, who is the great King, who is from the beginning, from everlasting to everlasting. He is our God who cares for us, who bears our burdens, who died for us upon the cross, who came as a, as a baby, that he might bear our sins upon the cross, but that he might rise, be glorified, and to come again as a glorious king, and that he might receive all the glory and honour and majesty, which is worthy of his great and glorious name. Well, God bless you. And thank you for joining us tonight.